thank you for joining us today for training tape number one. Our goal this year during the spring season is to release one training tape a week focusing on high school baseball rules, situations, and mechanics. Today's training tape will be on pitching topics, pitching positions, pace of play in high school, strike zone, umpire, ball, and strike mechanics. Pitching positions. There are three pitching positions, only two of which are legal to throw and deliver a pitch. The stretch is when a pitcher is taking signs. We cannot throw a legal pitch from this position. You have the set where the hands are together in front of the body. And then you have the windup where the pitcher is facing the batter and can do different motions with the non-pivot foot. Let's take a look into each pitching position a little bit closer. First is the windup. There are three ways in the windup position the pitcher could have their hands. As it shows in this picture, the hands can be together in front of the body. The pitcher could also have both hands on the side of the body. Or the final way, one hand in front of the body and the other at the side of the body. Pitchers, when in the wind-up position, will be assumed in the wind-up position when their pivot foot is not parallel to the pitcher's plate. And that non-pivot foot is free. So when in doubt, if that foot is not parallel, pitchers, you are deemed in the wind-up position. Pitchers cannot make any more than two pumps what is two pumps? A pump is the downward and upward motion of the arms. So for Federation High School rules, you could go down, up, down, up, and then you have to deliver a pitch. Pitchers may lift the non-pivot foot in a step backwards, sidewards, or forward. Then the final step forward towards home. When moving this non-pivot foot, the pivot foot could be turned, but it cannot be lifted off of the ground in the motion to deliver a pitch. The lifting of that pivot foot is indicating that pitcher is going to disengage the rubber to either legally become a fielder and make a play on a runner, or you can step up and off the pitcher's plate with that pivot foot and change to the set position. Stretch. Once again, a pitcher cannot deliver a pitch from this stretch position. All right. Only one stretch motion can be made. So a pitcher who gets the sign from the catcher starts coming together but stops and then gets another sign from the catcher, this is an illegal act. This is what we call a start and stop. If there's a runner on base or runners on base, that would be considered a balk because you are only allowed one stretch motion and a stretch motion is going from hands separated to hands together. Cannot deliver a pitch from the stretch position and pitchers must bring hands together before delivering a pitch. Pitching hand shall be at the side or behind the pitcher's back. The importance of this part of the rule is the pitcher cannot hide the ball on the hip where the runner or runners cannot view the ball. So you see this player, if the ball were in this player's hand, that is an illegal stretch position. The hand must be on the side where the runner and runners can see the ball or behind the back. You cannot hide the ball on the hip. The runner 
needs to know where that ball is. If it's in the glove, they know where the ball is. When it's in the hand, it's got to be on the back or side of that pitcher. Set position. The second legal position where now a pitcher can deliver a pitch. Ball shall be in hand or glove. Pivot foot shall be parallel to the pitcher's plate. So you see this pivot foot parallel, this foot parallel. All right, when that foot is parallel, we are in the set position, not wind up position. Question is asked, does the whole entire foot have to be touching the pitcher's plate? And the answer is no. Any part of the foot could be touching the 24 inch pitcher's plate. So maybe it's just the toe of the foot. Maybe it's just the heel of the foot, but it still has to be parallel. When moving from the stretch to set, pitcher's hands shall come together. A discernible stop at the chin or below. So right now, this glove is above the chin. This would be an illegal set for Federation High School Baseball. It must be at the chin or below. That way we know there is no aspiration going on the baseball. We must see the mouth when they are in the set position as umpires. Pitcher can make a jump turn. Move while gaining ground with the non-pivot foot towards the base. The pivot foot shall contact the ground before releasing the ball. So this is a quick jump turn. If they're jump turning towards first, their body can't go towards third. They can't release the ball while still in the air. That foot must come down to the ground before the release of the ball. And then the last part, portion, if the pitcher removes the pivot foot clearly behind the pitcher's plate, not on it, but behind it, they are now a fielder, they could feint a throw. All right? And this section, pivot foot must land behind the pitcher's plate before the hands separate. So jump move. Foot down before the release of the ball, becoming a fielder. Foot down before the hands separate. There was quite some discussion about pace of play during the preseason. We wanted to review these pitching pace of play rules for high school baseball. So first off, warm-up throws. A new pitcher is allowed eight warm-up throws within 60 seconds. This 60 seconds starts on the first throw by the pitcher. There might be times where the pitcher's out there waiting for the catcher or backup catcher to warm up that pitcher. If that pitcher throws to a teammate, that is to be considered one throw. That's when the 60 seconds starts to complete the seven other throws that pitcher is allowed. When that pitcher now is a returning pitcher, they are allowed five throws. This 60 seconds starts on the final out of the previous half inning. So when we uh, talk to coaches, hustle in, hustle out, you want to remind them if you feel they are delaying the game on purpose. L remind the coaches that the pitcher only has 60 seconds for their four, five warm-up throws. Again, we're not going to be quote-unquote sticklers on this and enforce every single time a pitcher's not complete their warm-up pitches with 62 seconds. But if you feel as an umpire, they are delaying the game on purpose. That is when you want to do preventive umpiring, communicate to the team that the 60 seconds has started for the five warm-up throws. Any teammate could warm up the pitcher as so long as they have a mask on. Uh, players must have mask on when taking warm-up throws. This is a federation difference. Crew chief can authorize more pitches due to injury or inclement weather. Okay, so if you feel as a crew chief, um, it was a long rain delay, inclement weather. 
the same pitcher is returning to the game. All right, we had a 30-minute break. We're going to allow more than five warm-up pitches. That's an example of authorizing more warm-up pitches because of inclement weather. Pitch clock. You see this all the time now in college baseball. We do not have a visual clock as umpires. And umpires, we're not asking you to have a 20-second timer that buzzes and goes off to enforce this rule. Again, this rule has been in Federation Baseball for quite some time. And it's there for times in which it is needed when a game is being intentionally delayed. So we're not looking for an automatic ball call at 21 seconds if everybody's doing what they're doing. But if the pitcher is not doing what they're doing, they're trying to delay the game, get that batter off balance, um, and play sort of the, the, the mind trick. There is a rule that states, pitcher shall attempt a pitch or play within 20 seconds. When does this 20 second start? When the pitcher receives the ball. If you feel a team is delaying on purpose, catcher's holding the ball to delay the game on purpose, the catcher has to immediately throw that ball back to the pitcher. Okay, so if you're in a game situation where either players are playing slow or intentionally choosing to play slow, again, don't enforce right away every single infraction. Let's be preventive, positive communicators, remind them of the expectations and what the rules are, and then if they refuse to follow the rules and expectations, now we have the rules to enforce the pace of play. Strike zone. Right, first, we're going to start with the definition. Space over home plate. All right, so here is a diagram of home plate. And when we mean space, we're not only talking about the whole entire ball over the 17 inches of space. We are talking about any part of the baseball that touches any part of home plate that is over home plate. So you see here plate is 17 inches. A ball on each side barely touching home plate is now 23 inches wide. That is the width of a high school strike zone. Now height. You have the Top of the shoulders, you have the waistline. Right in the middle is what they call the midpoint. This is the top of the strike zone. Notice, coaches will say that pitch was above the batter's elbows. Yes, the top of the strike zone is above the batter's elbows at time. So keep that in mind. When observers are going out, and we're going to show parts of the observation form. We are looking for umpires who are calling the high strikes consistently because that is the rule. Bottom of the zone is the knees. Right, just like we have the width of the strike zone, any part of the ball that touches any part of the knee is in the strike zone. So you see this rectangle box. High and low is larger than inside and outside. All right, so we have 23 inches width. All right, rectangle, we clearly have it more than 23 inches high to low. All right, the high to low does change batter to batter. All right, so a player who is six foot seven is not going to have the same height of a strike zone as a player who's five foot eight. We have to change that height of the strike zone while each batter is in a normal batting stance. So will this rectangle height be the same every single time? No, it will not. Will the width of this rectangle be the same every single time? Yes, it will. All right, so from an obser observer standpoint, it is easier for an observer to look for accuracy with width, because that never changes. All right? It's harder for high-low. 
But we will give you tips here coming up of how to properly get in position so you are accurate with high and low when the batters change with their height. The next one is a called strike. So this is when an umpire will call a strike because the batter did not strike at the pitch. All right, so a pitch that enters any part of the zone and that is not struck at, the umpire will come up hard, give a voice and signal at the very same time. We, this is where we pursue, per, persuade coaches with confidence we need clear, confident strike one, strike two, strike three calls. The more consistent you are with your confidence, strike one, strike two, strike three, will help with your consistency of a strike zone. We're going to take a look at some, some pitches here. Of acceptable strike is one, one ball off the plate, and an unacceptable strike is a pitch that touches the batter's box line. So what do we mean by a ball off the plate? This is not a ball off the plate. This is a ball on and over the plate. All right, so an acceptable high school strike is a ball off the plate. Not two baseballs, definitely not three baseballs. It is a ball that is not touching the plate. Those are acceptable strikes for high school baseball. Ball that goes over the opposite batter's box line. That cannot be called a strike in high school baseball. Notice how the catcher reaches outside his body frame again and brings the ball back in. This is a ball when it touches the opposite batter's box line. Another bird's eye view of a ball crossing the batter's box line. This is not a strike and cannot be a strike in high school baseball. It must be one ball off or the ball over the plate for it to be called a strike. Now let's take a look at acceptable strikes. The ball touching any part of the knee over the plate, strike call. A ball inside quote unquote the river so one ball off, but not touching the batter's box. So this was pitch number four in this sequence. Though the ball is not touching the line, it is one ball off the plate, which is an acceptable strike for high school baseball. Correctly called a strike. That is clearly over the plate, above the knee, correctly called, strike. Over the plate, at the knee, strike. Over the plate, above the knee, strike. This is an acceptable strike for high school baseball. We have any part of the ball one ball off, over the plate, correctly called strike, high school baseball. That is an acceptable strike. Acceptable strike. So this is not even a high strike. This is at the belt. There is a lot more room here, umpires. This is a Strike right down the middle. Acceptable, clear, strike. Acceptable strike in high school baseball. One ball off the zone. Any part of the ball that touches the box is a strike, and we can't miss those. One ball off the plate 
acceptable strike high school baseball. A ball is a pitch that does not strike the bat or touch the strike zone. Do not let the catchers, catchers fool you. We're going to take a look at a, a, a little clip here where a catcher is trying to frame the ball to trick the umpire. Do not let the catchers fool you. Here's one. Strike. Correctly called. Well outside the zone, and that catcher tries to stick it and frame it. Do not be fooled by that catcher. That is a ball. That is right on the in-between. When we talk about consistency, if it does not hit the batter's box and it's one ball off, we need to be consistent inside and outside, top of the inning, body, bottom of the inning. Strike. That is a ball outside, low of the strike zone. All right, so here the catcher could have fooled this umpire a little bit because of the stance. All right, let's replay it. This catcher's stance is now a little bit higher. Because the catcher stands a little bit higher, it might fool us. But we can't be fooled. All right? That is not even a high strike. That is a in-the-zone strike. So now that we know the rule of the strike zone, what are some mechanics we could participate in to have a consistent strike zone consistency is made when we set up in the slot we set up the same way every single time same foot same footwork every time some umpires like to go inside outside some umpires like to go outside inside foot whichever way you do it as long as you get your feet in the same position for a left-handed batter same position for a right-handed batter you will strive and be more consistent the second part is the slot what do we mean by the slot so this is a right-handed batter so this umpire is between the catcher and the batter Good tip, put your nose at that spot in which you are going to call a strike. Right, so I'm going to set my nose on the inside portion of the strike zone where it's going to be an acceptable strike. Because when a ball is coming at me on the inside part of the zone, I have an idea of if the catcher doesn't catch it, where is it going to hit me? If it's square in the nose, we have a strike. If it's to the left of the nose, it's a ball. To the right of the nose, as so long as it's not outside the outside portion of the strike zone, I have a strike. So consistency. Footwork in the same spot. Put your nose on the inside portion of that strike zone. Next is timing. See the ball out of the pitcher's hand. Track that ball into the catcher's glove with zero head movement you will only have eye movement if you move your head that zone moves so great thing about high school baseball a lot of the games are now streamed if you have an opportunity to watch yourself look at your footwork are you moving your head that will help figure out if your zone is inconsistent, how to make it more consistent. The other thing, do not judge a pitch until the pitch is over. A lot of times, umpires, you're determining the pitch out in front of home plate. No, see it out in front of home plate. See it into the glove. Once you hear the smack of the glove, now judge it. Timing, 
timing, timing. Mentally, every pitch is a new pitch. A drill we teach on the rubber, get set, call it. We're not going to be 100% correct. If I miss a pitch, I don't want to miss the next one. On the rubber, get set, call it. Also, don't get into that mindset of, oh, this is a 3-0 count. We got to have a big zone. Oh, this is a 1-2 count. Now the pitcher has to put it on the plate. Every count, the zone is the same. If you have a, a, a larger acceptable strike zone, it has to be the same. 3-0-0-2. Last one is confidence. Stay down when you call a ball. Come up strong on your strike calls. When you flinch like you're going to come up with a strike, but you call a ball, that is what is going to clue fans, players, coaches, that you are not confident. Stay down on balls. Come up strong on strikes. When communicating balls, let the catcher know. Ball out. Ball down. Ball up. And you don't have to sell a ball. If you have to sell a ball, call a strike. And when you call a strike, come up strong. So we're going to take a look at just the mechanics here. See how this umpire is over the catcher's mask? We want this umpire more to the right. So it's clearly in between the batter and catcher. When we're behind this catcher, there's two things. First and most important is safety. Foul balls go straight back. So if we are straight back behind the catcher, we're more than likely going to get hit more in the mask. So move over more to the right in between the batter and the catcher for your safety purposes. Second thing is vision. If you are over the catcher and you track the baseball to that outside corner, your eyes are going to be blocked by the catcher's head. When you're more to your right, clearly between the batter and the catcher, and you track that ball to the outside corner, the catcher's mask is not going to get into your way. So positioning will play in consistency. For those umpires working in Nebraska, this is a little segment of the observation form for the state of Nebraska. What observers are looking for? Plate mechanics takes proper position in the slot. Place his head in the same position and is still on every pitch. Checks corners prior to pitch. All right. When observing umpires, we could typically tell a good strike zone just based on the plate umpire's pre-pitch mechanics. Are they doing the same thing from pitch one to pitch 217? It's habit. When you participate in proper habits, you have success. Next one is judgment of the strike zone. Calls the high and low strikes. And when the ball is over the plate, calling those pitches. If we see umpires that are calling strikes, that are touching batter's box lines, that is not good judgment of the strike zone. If we see umpires calling some high strikes, then balling those same pitches, it's not a good, consistent strike zone. All right, so we're looking for umpires who call the high, call the low, get the acceptable strikes consistently, and not going back and forth. Proper mechanics is going to help with this. Use of voice and signals makes call clear with voice and proper techniques. All right, so... Your strike one, your strike two, your strike three is the same throughout a game. We're not changing strike one, strike two, and strike three from batter to batter, team to team. Right? We want consistent, proper signals and techniques. That's what we call confidence and composure throughout a game. And the last is timing of calls. Right? So this is the avoiding of the flinch, right? avoiding of moving of the head. That's what observers are, are using to grade and evaluate 
an umpire. They see the pitch, then they judge the pitch, then they call the pitch. There's literally three-step process when it comes to timing pitches. That does conclude week one training tape for the spring baseball season. i um, like to thank umpires who have registered for NSAA and NHSOA umpiring. Hope this video helps you prepare for the beginning of the season. Um, if you are watching this video, um, please subscribe to Time Out with PSOA. We have daily rules questions and daily shorts posted to help educate not only the umpires, but coaches, players, and fans. The whole intent of this training is to help all aspects, all people involved in baseball get an understanding of what the rule is, what thresholds are, and what's the proper way to communicate what the players did. Thank you for taking time out today. Hope to see you again next week.